the, the, the topic that was given to me <coughs> is the theory of evolution scientific? That's an interesting question. Uh, actually kind of a very fuzzy question. Uh, but so what's the answer? Well, yes, but that's a meaningless question unless we be sure we know what we're talking about. Is something scientific? That's used in all kinds of ways, often confusing and unspecified ways and in, inappropriately very often. So we need to look at, at this carefully. <coughs> when we say, is something scientific, what does that mean? It can mean several things. Uh, one can mean it can be studied uses, using a scientific method. That's probably the most, the, the, you know, the best meaning for that phrase can mean it falls within the philosophy and assumptions that scientists, uh, most scientists accept, which of course are, are very much oriented to naturalism. No, no miracles, uh, everything happens just by the laws of chemistry and physics. <coughs> now you, you can, clearly you can study this with evidence. You've got all kinds of fossils you can look at and there, there's plenty of, so you can use a scientific method, that's very clear. <coughs> and this kind of approach here clearly falls within the philosophy that, that mainline science accepts. So yeah, in those senses, it's scientific. We'll come back to this one after a bit. <coughs> how would we decide something like this? Well, you know, the, you, how do you decide anything? There's several th ways we can approach it. Just think about it. As the story goes, supposedly uh, Plato would answer how many teeth a horse has by thinking. How many teeth should a horse have? Well, we can do that. We can think about how things should function, uh, what, how life should begin. Not terribly satisfying, uh, but we often do that, I, I guess. <coughs> we can examine data. Go out and or open the horse's mouth and count. Um, that would be science. You collect data. Maybe you start with a hypothesis. Maybe you just make observations but you, you use that to make your decision. <coughs> or we could ask God about it. Now, if we ask him how many teeth a horse has, I think he'd say, uh, well, you know, I gave you eyes and I gave you a brain. Why don't you go count them? Uh, he doesn't seem to answer questions that we could easily figure out ourselves and that have no spiritual significance. He, he will help us with other things. So those are some of the ways we could approach this. <coughs> so we come to this, back to this, and it's certainly, um, you know, we could think about it, but we, we, can, we can collect data and use that method, and that seems to be a good method. Um, but then we need to come down to this question, is, is it true? <coughs> and that's a little bit different, and that's not quite so easy. Uh, is it true? Well, um, when we're looking at horses' teeth and when we're doing studies in the laboratory, we need to do this with, with evidence. The things that we can study in, in, a, in a chemistry laboratory, uh, like this building, we're in the biochemistry building, um, we need to have confidence that God has made the world in such a way that we can do our experiments, do our observations, and we will get reliable results. He doesn't normally tinker with the universe. Uh, science has convinced us of that. <coughs> He has made an exquisite set of laws that, uh, that we can use. But there are limitations. Changing interpretations with new evidence means that science doesn't offer proof. Um, TV commercials offer you proof, but you know, science doesn't. Not properly so. <coughs> um, it used to be uh, a, a concept in molecular biology was referred to as a central dogma. One gene controls one protein. Well, now it's understood to be far more complex than that. And so things change with, with new evidence. We learn new things. We find out what we thought uh, is wrong. <coughs> Science doesn't offer proof. It doesn't really offer disproof. Disproof is, is easier to come by than proof, but even that has its limits because we don't have uh, all the data. We never have all the data. When we go to Jesus' miracles, now what's the proper approach? Um, I've heard presentations where people seem to feel that they can use science to say whether or not God did miracles, Jesus did miracles. Um, 
I've heard discussions about what the Bible talks about with leprosy, and I, and I hope those physicians use better methods when they try to evaluate me than they, when they try to evaluate Jesus' miracles. Uh, we were not there. We did not see. Science has absolutely nothing to say about that. <coughs> no proof or disproof. Uh, it just has nothing to say. How about geological history and evolution? Well, <coughs> Um, here we can get data. We're also dealing with things from the ancient past. And so what is the, the is reality? Probably uh, we, need, we certainly need to use some science, but, uh, but this may go beyond what, what science can actually determine. And so is it scientific? Well, you know, we have to look a little more at our definition. And actually, before we can do that, we need to define what we mean by evolution. We ask the question, is evolution scientific? That, that's not a, you can't give a simple answer for the whole picture. <coughs> Microevolution, speciation, uh, adaptation. Uh, we're, especially here at Loma Linda, uh, we're very familiar with how bacteria uh, acquire resistance to, to antibiotics. Uh, that's evolution. That's microevolution. Um, these, these three species of chipmunks are extremely similar, um, yet they have a li little differences and they know each other apart. Their chromosomes are the same, their proteins are, their chipmunks are very discouraging for mammalogists who study systematics, trying to understand the, the limits of the species, because they're so, so similar, and yet they know each other apart. So uh, species seem to have obviously uh, developed in this world since, since creation. Uh, and there are many more examples of, of this we could give. <coughs> so, uh, is when we're studying these kind of things, uh, the Bible really doesn't give us any help. It, it, there's nothing in the Bible that is specific enough to tell us whether or not new species can, uh, can arrive, uh, arise and whether animals can adapt to changing conditions. Uh, it just doesn't address that at all. <coughs> So we, we're limited to using science when, when we're studying this. Descent from a common ancestor. This is the other big part of evolution. Descent from a common ancestor. Um, did these things all evolve in this way? And that is the, the big question. That is the one where, where we have our arguments between those who believe in, in the Bible and those who don't. Uh, the tree of life. We refer to this. Um, you can again use evidence. We can use the methods of science, but is that adequate? Is, is that going to do the job? <coughs> we were not there. Uh, we did not observe what actually happened. We can't be so sure about ancient history. <coughs> and again, the, the picture changes as we collect more data. Um, there's a, a, a little article I read recently. It, it, uh, it's saying that the tree of life is collapsing basically. The uh, evolution, evolutionists generally are very confident this is true, and yet there are more and more problems arising with, with advance in molecular uh, genetics, understanding of the genetic system, and uh, the more of the evidence. There are a lot of uh, uh, genes here and there called orphan genes. They don't fit this scheme. Uh, it's hard to explain them, their origin with, with this. Uh, many times these are explained by, by lateral transfer, that is gene transfer of genetic material between different kinds of organisms, very different kinds of organisms. Um, one author has, is describing the situation as, uh, uh, uses the term public goods, like various genes are, are for the, in, the, in the animal world are public goods, animal and plant world. They're, they're shared here and there, and it's, it's assumed it's by lateral transfer, by Viruses that will carry this genetic material from one type of organism to another. Um, th the data are that, that we have genes various places that don't seem to fit this scenario. The question is how'd they get there? Well, if you, if you don't accept the idea that there might be a design, then your option is lateral transfer of uh, these jumping genes. These things jumping, being carried from one organism to another. <coughs> so this is not so sure at all anymore, even less than it used to be. So maybe we should ask God. And so 
for this this part of evolution theory, it, it's a mixture. Yeah, evolution uh, science can help us, but uh, but we probably will need more information on that. So we ought to ask God what he what he has to say about it. He was there, and was the, uh, observed the whole thing, and and was very much involved, created it, created the original life. So when we're asking a question like which of these is closer to the truth, um, we need some outside information. <coughs> uh, what I observe in the world leads me to think this is somewhat uh, realistic. <laughs> we give an example, I, I, I hear statement made sometimes, well, you know, you, all these organisms, anywhere from people to, to caterpillars and worms and others, they have the same biochemistry. Therefore, isn't that interesting? We must have all evolved from a common ancestor. Okay, what are the data? We do have the same biochemistry. Is that true? Interpretation? Well, how do we know which of these is right if all we have is science? This is a, be a tough one to answer with, with science alone. <coughs> common ancestor or common design. And the same thing here. Yeah, we have the same biochemistry. Again, what is the interpretation? Uh, trilobites are some of the earliest Cambrian creatures. They found a lower Cambrian. And yet, if you think about, about this, trilobites must have had the very same biochemistry as we have. Okay, were they primitive creatures starting to get, well, not really. Uh, how would I, why would I say they have the same biochemistry as we have? Well, <coughs> trilobites are in the same group as, as the uh, insects, our arthropoda. And uh, if we t look at this from, a, from an evolutionary perspective, all right, both uh, trilobites, well, trilobites are um, right at the very bottom in the Cambrian. And we see that insects today have the same biochemistry we have. And insects, the common ancestor for insects and trilobites and us would have to be way down below the bottom of the Cambrian. Okay, and if so, if, if we today, if insects and us today had the same biochemistry, that had to be present in the original ancestor. Um, and so if we take the, the naturalistic scenario would tell us that trilobites, some of the earliest Cambrian organisms, had the same biochemistry we have. Um, if, we, if we take a creationist perspective, uh, we, don't, we can't say for sure. God could have made trilobites weird, but probably not. He prob they probably have, are, again, the same as, as the insects. <coughs> so is evolution scientific? Well. Yeah, you can use the methods of science, but if you want to know, is it true, you have to, you're going to have to go beyond what science can tell us. Worldviews and assumptions are very, very important. I hear people, theologians, saying science has facts, religion has assumptions. Okay, does, that, does science not have any assumptions? Uh, actually, that is a very, um, very naive concept. That, that religion has assumptions, science has facts. The, nat the philosophy of naturalism, or you could say it's a worldview of, of naturalism, uh, that is a philosophy. How, if we take two concepts here, um, there have been no miracles, everything has happened by the laws of nature, or God has performed miracles in origins. What scientific observations would we test between those? I mean, we could look at things like the time scale and radiometric dating, but still that really doesn't answer it. Um, this is strictly philosophy, not science. You can't, you can't make the difference here based, at, based on science. And yet, much of modern science deals dri directly in this philosophy, this assumption of naturalism. All observations are interpreted according to that assumption. Uh, and in, in many cases, like ultimate or questions about origins, this philosophy is, is not only influential, it is, it dominates. You, you cannot explain life any other way than by naturalism. That's what science generally says. <coughs> so how do we come to this? 
to this naturalistic philosophy? Well, it's an interesting story. <clears throat> Why science has come to that is not a scientific matter. It's a matter of history, a matter of sociology. Um, in the Middle Ages, scientists used some inappropriate methods. They were very tied to ancient Greek authorities, ancient Greek scientists, is there as where, that's where authority comes from. And they would make, uh, there were a lot of things not known. They'd make quickie, mystical explanations of things. Uh, the, the, the blood flows through the body because of uh, you know, mystical processes going on. Uh, and, and science needed to get rid of those things in order to, to move on to its modern success. The problem is they moved out of one ditch and slid over into another ditch, the other extreme, assuming that God has never done any miracles. Well, science can't demonstrate that. That's strictly an assumption. Uh, that's, not, that's not based on science. Uh, it dominates science today. And it limits science's ability to, to, uh, to objectively evaluate these questions about evolution. <coughs> So if we make this assumption, will God honor that assumption? Is he up there saying, oh, well, I guess scientists don't like this, so I better not do any miracles. I, I don't think he's going to worry too much about our arbitrary assumptions that we've made. Does he chuckle at our naivety? I think that's probably uh, what's happening. <coughs> Give a little example of some of this that I used in, in the book. Um, my, uh, my dad's name was George Brand, and he, he, had, he asked uh, a, 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 an expert on genealogies to, to give us some input on where we came from, where, you know, trace our genealogy back. Well, the guy came with uh, attaching us to a long, long line of, of um, very prominent British brands. <coughs> okay, there's only one slight problem. He didn't, under, he didn't know Grandpa Brand. Uh, he was a, a, um, a peasant farmer in Austria, um, you know, not too much education. When my dad was in the upper grades, elementary school there in, in Austria, he'd come home, tell his parents what he'd been learning. So he told them he learned that, that the earth uh, is round and it rotates. And his dad said, oh, those dumb fools, what do they know? If the earth was rotating, we'd all fall off. Well, actually, that, that was perfectly reasonable logic, you know, some centuries back when we didn't understand gravity or anything like that. Uh, but anyway, Grandpa, he had some other interesting habits. He named his first half dozen children Brant. On the birth certificates, that's what it says. The last half dozen, and there were a dozen, there were a dozen overall, he named them Brant. Okay, he made, a, he made a choice. He made an intelligent choice. At least we assume it's intelligent. Nobody knows why he did it, but um, that's, that's where we are. So... Our, our genealogy expert blew it because he, he assumed that things were happening by, by the orderly operation of laws. But no, there was an intellig intelligent choice involved here. When you have intelligent choices, science is not always able to understand that, <coughs> our, our conventional ways of doing science, unless we're willing to, to ask questions of somebody who might know, like, like God. I... Um, <coughs> I often tell my, my students, half of what we're teaching you is wrong. Okay, well, why would I say that? Well, we'll have to wait for more scientific discoveries to know which half. That's the problem. Um, science keeps moving on, and we, there are lots of things that I've written which I know now are wrong. Uh, I'll have to correct them in, in later writings. But that's the way science is. It moves on, and we don't always know. Um, which half? And I, I can give you a specific example. In this book on page 181, I, I made this statement. <coughs> Microevolution change within a species which generally occurs through mutations and natural selection. Now natural selection clearly is a, is a dominant force in nature. There's no question about that. But the role of mutations is becoming much more muddy uh, with, with modern molecular uh, understanding, <coughs> discoveries. Uh, at, I was at vertebrate paleontology meetings, um, I, I don't remember just when it was, 10 or 15 years ago, and a very eminent member of that uh, group, um, evolutionary bi biologist, paleontologist, um, he was talking about um, 
evo devo, that is uh, evolutionary understanding of development. And he made the statement that, that the Darwinian synthesis um, needs to be redone. And the Darwinian synthesis, that's the, the modern um, concept of evolution that developed in the 1940s and, and around there. <coughs> that has been pretty much the ruling paradigm in evolution. He said that needs to redone, be redone. And he said, this time we're not going to blow it. I wonder what he meant. <coughs> Well, this year there's some interesting publications coming out that make it a little more clear what he meant because they're, they're now kind of pulling together, and I'm talking about evolutionists, not creationists, the very eminent evolutionists are pulling together what uh, new discoveries in molecular biology, molecular genetics are telling us about how the system all works. <coughs> and uh, here's a little illustration of what they're finding. I'm using an analogy from an automobile factory. <coughs> okay, this here we've got a machine that makes bolts and a machine that makes pistons. And so here's one, uh, you know, it's functioning this way, and then you, time goes on, and you have a random mutation. Maybe lightning hits this machine, and it, it changes one little setting <laughs> in, in the computer that controls this process. Changes one setting, now you've got longer bolts. So a random mutation makes a change. Over here, the same thing happens. Another lightning strike changes a little setting in the computer. You end up with wider pistons. Okay, random mutation and natural selection. That is the Darwinian theory of how, how things changes come about. Well, what they're finding now, which are being expressed very dis clearly in some of these publications, that it doesn't work that way. It's more like this. Um, <coughs> You know, it used to be thought the DNA is, is a rather, the process is quite static. Uh, DNA gives the instructions. That, that, the information always goes down to making proteins. There's never any feedback going both ways. Now it's understood that's, that's simply wrong. Um, in this analogy, you've got sensors. <coughs> the cell has lots of sensors that are sensing the environment. Uh, here we have in this analogy a uh, sensor determining how the cylinder, uh, the, the piston fits in the cylinder, the amount of vibration, the stress on the piston, the temperature, the rotation speed. And it's giving feedback to, to all these other control, uh, controllers. Two or three stages of controllers, oil mixtures, piston lengths, piston widths, metal compositions. And they're feeding back to a, to a, a set of standby specifications uh, all ready to be inserted when needed. Um, and so this is, uh, and then we have an error correction system that or works in the cell, uh, correcting message mistakes in the DNA, orders of magnitude better than was thought previously. So in the cell, you've got sensors that are detecting the environment. You have, um, they're feeding back to the genetic system, determining how to express this DNA. Uh, you've got feedback between the proteins and the DNA. It isn't a simple system. And uh, one, of the, one author <coughs> describes this, what's going on, by the term natural genetic engineering. The, the cell engineers how the DNA is going to be expressed and what this, the, the organism is actually going to be like. And of course you have in that epigenetics, where the environment influences, again, how the genes are expressed. Uh, how if uh, the, uh, a baby is born and lives in a certain environment, that influences how its DNA is expressed, and that will continue for, for three or four generations. And then it may revert back if, if conditions change. <coughs> so a very, very sophisticated system. And this one author who, who is, gives a really nice summary of all this, he points out that in this system, there's really no place for, for random mutations. Um, now, a lot of evolutionary biologists, his colleagues, don't like that. They criticize him. But here, his response is their, their, their objections are philosophical, not scientific. They're not based on, um, on empirical observations. Um, okay, so this is how this all plays out in the coming years is going to be very interesting. But there's, there's a lot coming out on this. Uh, they, these authors are totally committed to, dar to, to evolution, that life has evolved. But they're recognizing that the way this must happen is, is not as Darwin saw it. it it's very, very, uh, the title of one little author, little paper was uh, 
What's, what's under the hood continues to drop jaws. What's happening inside the cell is absolutely amazing and is, uh, <coughs> un, un, was not uh, uh, you know, predicted at all. <coughs> but data are moving in a fascinating direction here. Could okay. you give us the name of that author? Yeah, it's James Shapiro. And his book is, is uh, called Evolution, A View from the 21st Century. James Shapiro, and the book is Evolution, A View from the 21st Century. There are other books, too, uh, on this topic, but his is the, the most readable uh, as, as in a beginning place to, to read about this. <coughs> okay, so what happens if you have a random mutation? Well, here's what's most likely. You have system failure or reduced efficiency or the mutation is simply eliminated by this error correction system. That's why he's saying there, there's no place here for random mutations. Natural selection, certainly, it will inf influence what variant is more likely to survive. But how do you get there? Okay, he doesn't say this. He just says how this all evolved is a mystery. Um, I would say that it's l what's really, I think, is happening here is that evolution will only happen within the parameters put there in the beginning by the creator. Um, dogs were made to vary tremendously, you know. Cats, no. Uh, a lot of other animals. Chipmunks, just very little variation. Brown squirrels, much more variation. I would, I would uh, my uh, assessment of that is probably those are limits put there in the beginning by the creator. Evolution can happen within the parameters already put there in, in the each group's genetic system. <coughs> from the beginning. <coughs> so this was not a long chapter, so my, my talk is not uh, lengthy. Uh, here are my conclusions. Evolution can be studied by the methods of science. Certainly, that's, that's very clear. Uh, evolution is consistent with a naturalistic worldview prominent in science. So the way science is normally function, the way it normally functions, yeah, it's, you clearly can study it scientifically. Is it true? Well, microevolution, it seems to, that can be addressed by science, and the answer appears to be yes. We aren't going to offer proof or disproof in science, but that's the way it appears. <coughs> Descent from a common ancestor, that's a little more difficult to answer. The, and the picture is getting much more muddy as with more data. Uh, if you're just looking at what science has to offer, um, yeah, some data are very supportive. Other data are, are of a serious problem. Um, <coughs> if all we're going to have is science, it, it's hard to know for sure what the answer is there. Uh, I think the answer is moving more and more to where to the, in the direction of no, it didn't happen that way. Uh, but um, can't be sure. Ask, good idea to ask God. He was there, and it is a spiritually significant question. And uh, from that source, I would say the answer is no. Uh, the tree of life is not correct. So furthermore, we all have unanswered questions. There are plenty of things we could talk about here that, that this Sabbath School talks about every week. Uh, you know, time scale and dating methods and all those things. Um, there are, those are, I don't have answers to those, but there are plenty of unanswered questions in the other direction as well. We all have unanswered questions. And here's a question that doesn't sound very scientific. Do I know Jesus? I would say this is the most important question for understanding ancient history of life. Do I know him well enough to trust what he told us about origins? And that, that's really, uh, for me and for many of us, that's, that's the bottom line. Although mainline science uh, won't accept that at all. OK, that's uh, my short chapter. Uh, so we have time for questions. Does your theory of chipmunks work for mankind? We read that there, our common ancestor was a woman in Africa. So from her, do we have all the variations of mankind? Well, you're asking a loaded question. Um, that's one interpretation of the evidence. Uh, I would say from Adam and Eve, yeah, there's, there obviously was a lot of variation put there. Uh, 
And we, we are different. We look around the room and we look different. Okay, why do we look different? We can, we can make some guesses, some of which involve evolution, natural selection. For instance, why are some of our friends, why do they have black skin instead of our pale faces? Well, if you look at the original distribution of the, the darker races, they're on the equator. And uh, my, my dermatologist tells me they have a 10-point scale for, for the darkness of skin, the pigmentation. The, 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 the highest, the darkest skin really have, have uh, no, virtually no incidence of skin cancer. That's probably really important in the tropics where you're bombarded by that intense sun all the time. Uh, that's one hypothesis for why we have such difference in skin. There's really no, there's no real difference. We all have the same pigments. It's just how, how much of the pigments. And whereas those of us, those pale faces from the north, uh, we needed to have, we couldn't have dark skin or we wouldn't get enough sunlight to produce enough vitamin D. And so that's, that's one way of uh, some of those changes might have occurred. Uh, I um, agree. Um, I, I think you've done an excellent job of going through a description of uh, Darwinian evolution and its uh, potential holes. But it seems to me you've left untouched a very significant question. And that is, uh, I think you're assuming that if Darwinian evolution doesn't work, then the alternative is uh, creation or creationism. What's to prevent there from being some alternative sequence that science can investigate that we're only beginning to see the, um, uh, the broad outlines of that turns out to be different from the creation story? Oh, that, that could be. There are other, other hypotheses you could come up with. Um, I personally think what God has to say is, is, um, has a far higher reliability mm -hmm. than those, those concepts of science is coming up with. But, you know, I couldn't prove, you, prove it one way or the other. So it isn't, it isn't either or. I, no, I, the the way or. you talked about it, I thought you were suggesting that it was either or. Yeah, no. If Darwinian evolution <laughs> is in some way deficient, then our only other option is um, a few thousand years ago and all life forms coming into existence over a short period of time. No, the question is much, much bigger than that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that um, biological ways to come up with these greater, with these great variety of creatures uh, is, is simply becoming less and less probable. But there are many other questions to address. Ariel. Mm -hmm. uh, very much appreciate uh, your approach here, and I appreciate your uh, suggestion we need to get back to Jesus, the Bible, and so on, that this is the solution uh, for many of us. Uh, you may recall uh, when we used to uh, be in this battle in the 1970s about the creation evolution being taught in public schools in California. And uh, you and I went up to Sacramento to, uh, following that, Seagraves <clears throat> uh, group uh, lodged a lawsuit. This was about 10 years later. Lodged a lawsuit uh, here in California against uh, public school teaching of evolution and they accused evolution of being a religion. Uh, as I look at this issue, and I'm trying to think, what is the best approach we could have? A, a redemptive approach, not a, uh, I'm going to prove you wrong approach, a redemptive approach uh, for these scientists who are, uh, more or less closed to uh, to uh, alternatives, such as you know, um, Jesus has the answer. This is not the language they they uh, get enthused about. Uh, what do you think our approach should be uh, in reference to that that paradox, that difficulty? And, and you mentioned sociology and so on. I think it's very important in science. Uh, anyway, I'm just interested in your ideas there. 
Well, I can tell you what I do. Um, I remember well those those sessions there. And I remember after a public hearing in the hallway, I, I was talking to a, a gentleman who at that time was a professor at Berkeley, and he's director of a lab studying the, the origin of life. Um, and I asked him a question. I said, okay, let's say, consider two hypotheses. One is the original life forms were created by God, by a designer. The other hypothesis, the original life forms were not created by any God or any designer. I said, what experiments would you do to test between those? And he immediately said, there's no way you can test between those. And yet, 15 minutes later, he gave a talk <coughs> making it very clear that the only option that we have is that, that there was no creator, that it all evolved. Well, anyway, how do I do it? I won't give this talk to, to my atheist colleagues. And I, I know quite a few p scientists who are atheists or agnostics. I, they know me. They, I collaborate and research with some of them. Uh, some of them are, are inter reviewers of my papers, the research papers. <coughs> so what do I do with them? I don't argue these things with them. I work with them. We're good friends. Uh, they, they know to one degree or another how I think. Uh, some of them know very much about what I think. Um, if I do good quality science, it, it typically happens that, th that they stop making jokes about creation. Or they, you know, we just become good friends. Now, if that, I, my hope is that someday that will come to the point where they'll start asking questions, and then I'll try to answer their questions. But I think our first uh, duty is to become friends. So we had a graduate student a few years back. He, he pushed me. He says, what are the best arguments to win, you know, the best um, issues to win arguments about evolution? I said, none. <laughs> You're taking the wrong approach. You just need to become friends. And if, if it comes to where they begin to ask questions, then you need to be ready to answer questions. Um, what are those answers when, you, when you're ready to give them? Well, I would judge that according to where I think they are. And <coughs> I think uh, there's one good friend I do research with up in Wyoming. He, he knows what I believe. He doesn't, he's not yet asking questions, and I, I don't really push him. There's another one that I've spent time with, and I'm clearly an atheist. I've spent time with him out in the field. He is, he's asked lots of questions. He knows, we've talked in detail about how I use uh, a biblical perspective to actually help me come up with hypotheses, and, and which help me to notice things in science. He, we talk about that specifically. We've spent hours talking about these things, and he... He's very open and wants to know, wants to understand. And so I can pr go farther. He asks me questions like, what is heaven and what's hell and what's salvation? And I talk about those. And, and I talk about how I deal with science. So you've got you to know the person and, and judge your answers accordingly. Does it also matter whether you do more research in textual language or more theoretical language? Because if you do trust, Yes, very much so. It, it has to be. They have to have respect. It was a question back. I appreciate your. Uh, oh, uh, I appreciate your statement that uh, uh, we have to wait for new scientific discoveries. Sometimes, also, sometimes I think that we are standing in a bucket and trying to lift ourselves up off the ground, because on one hand, you make this statement, which. I appreciate very, very much. But then there is those forces on the East Coast who remain nameless, who make statements that we uh, say it, therefore we deem it true. And how do you reconcile that uh, as we continue to grow in scientific discovery? Um, well, first of all, I, I need to uh, know my Bible and know whether I agree with the fellows on the East Coast or not. Um, if, I, if I found that I could not agree with Seventh-day Adventist teachings, I'd be out of here. I've been out of here a long time ago. I could not in good conscience accept a salary if I couldn't believe, couldn't, you know, if I was out of tune with the organization that employs me. But also, I, I think it goes beyond what you're I implying. Um, 
if I simply accept the assumptions that science works on, then I will only come to the same kind of conclusion. Because, because of those are very controlling assumptions. But I, um, I and some of my colleagues for, for decades have been using uh, a biblical point of view, a uh, Seventh-day Adventist point of view, to, to suggest to us new ideas about how, to, how we, things we might find out there in nature. And I find when we do that, we make discoveries that other people could have made, but they're not noticing because they're not asking the right questions. And so it isn't one-sided. We're, um, we're not in a bucket. <laughs> we're, we're free to inquire, and if we, if we ask new questions, we find things that other people are not finding. And so um, I, I see the evidence moving uh, towards supporting our point of view. Now, it's not moving real rapidly. There, there take too many lifetimes to really change the whole picture. But, um, but we make discoveries that others, others are not making. And I, one of this fellow, for instance, that I, this atheist I spent time with in the field, we talk about this. And I showed him some, some peculiar thing that I had found. And he, he made the comment. He says, you do have a different search image. He said, I would have looked at that and said, well, that's odd, and gone on. But because we're asking different questions, we recognize that that is something significant that needs to be, that others are not seeing and are not understanding. And I see a whole world of that kind of thing out there just waiting to be done. <coughs> yeah. Dr. Brand, um, I was interested in what you were saying as a teacher that you would tell your students, actually tell your students that half the things I tell you are going to be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, my question is, if a theologian came up to his class and told him, told them that half the things that he's going to teach is wrong, would he be judged incompetent? Well, science, science by nature has to, has to agree basically with what I said. Maybe they wouldn't say half, but I mean, science has to, has to accept that. But, it's, but it is based on interpretation. Just like theology is. Yeah, but it's, but it's based, yeah. And when we say half of what we're telling you is wrong, that's based on experience. We see that science keeps changing. Now, theology, theology is different. It's, it's, so theology is worthless if there isn't actually a revelation. And so the, the theologian needs to be able to understand. Um, but is the data revelation, revelation. in a way? Isn't the data revelation in a way? Oh, yeah. We, we, so we, when you we, get... When you get revelation from mm -hmm. God, that's more data, and then you still have to interpret that data. Absolutely, yes. And we don't un we don't have it all right. So, um, but it's not a it's not a clear picture here. Now, the science would never claim that there is anything absolute behind what it's doing. There is no God that's giving revelation. At least claims that there is there is divine revelation. Our task is to understand what it says, and it, it's important. There's a method I describe in one of my books about how to deal with this kind of thing. And that is, uh, you got religion, you got science. We don't understand them, either one of them fully adequately. And I, I, but rather than keep them separate in different boxes or, or saying you have science tells revelation what to, or tells religion what to say, we need a method where, that, that where challenges, where there are conflicts, they challenge us to think about both very carefully. And, and study both and, and pursue a better understanding of both. And that's our task. Well, I was just reading a very common reference in the area of the healthcare. The, the, the European left, their country to come to America for the freedom of uh, religion. But after they came within 11 years, they become the same as anybody else. They start saying you've got to believe one way, and you've got to go to church on Sundays. They persecute the others. Right, and they persecute the others. Is it because they will keep searching for more what Luther said? Are they searching for what Calvin said? Because they didn't finish, they didn't complete all the way. They did as much as they can do at that time. Uh, but the people did not study continuously, so they became... So they became persecuting other people. Isn't this something similar to it's not changing completely, uh, the, like as you were saying in the classroom that what you teach today could be wrong next you know, year or so. But also religion have to be, 
people cannot just stagnate about their ideas, just like the Romans papers to thought what they believed in was the best way of religion. I'm yeah. just, just something to think about. Yeah, they, the, the, back in all this era of persecution, one group would <coughs> move away from the area where they were being persecuted, but then they'd persecute the others. And so they were not willing to keep studying and keep thinking and realizing there's more to learn. That, that's very important. Yeah, uh, I have a question, but uh, before that, I, uh, I'm not sure. You work for the Geoscience Research Institute, no? You're uh, Loma Linda? Loma Linda. Okay. Okay, well, maybe... Uh, Is that better or worse? <laughs> 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 well, my question uh, lose some significance because I was going to ask you how often have you been invited to La Sierra to talk about this. I'm a graduate from La Sierra and I do care for what is taking place there. And uh, there's another Sabbath school I uh, attend quite often where people from La Sierra have uh, been teaching something totally different. And uh, so, you know, uh, how come two, at one time, last year was part of Loma Linda. Mm -hmm. And to think that uh, they have diverged uh, so drastically because, you know, over there, it's my understanding is it is being taught that uh, science has the really the facts, like you said, and religion is just belief based on myth or whatever. So yeah, I, I, was, I was the chairman of that biology department for 17 years when the two campuses were one university. And I could tell you, I won't, but I could tell you a lot of story behind that. They, they haven't asked me to come and talk, and I don't think they will. I know the, some of those biologists very well, and they don't like my point of view. And um, you know, they probably won't ask me. Um, Different, they start, in a, like one of them has spent a number of sessions in my office doing his best to convince me that, that, that theistic evolution is right. Um, I don't find his arguments convincing. Now regarding common ancestry, you talk quite a bit about common ancestry. One of the, one of the ways to uh, uh, answer this question. And uh, you mentioned Cambrian. How do you pronounce Cam it? Cambrian. Cambrian. Okay. Now, suppose we assume that common descent is the truth mm -hmm. or represents the truth, how things happened. Then we do have evidence. We can go up to the Cambrian explosion. We have a whole bunch of animals uh, and fossils. Now, can we trace? Can we trace the different life forms to a single common ancestor. No. What, is th what, what does the evidence okay, point the, at? The, the evidence, a, a very important line of their evidence is molecular similarities. Um, you, if you look at the fossils, the, there are basically all of the phyla of organisms are, are there at the Cambrian. Okay, why? Well, and so you can't answer it that way from the fossils. Uh, they, they look at the, uh, the similarity in the biochemistry and the DNA, and they assume that that will tell them common ancestry. But of course, that if two things are very similar, that could be because they were designed that way. Um, and so that doesn't really answer it. Now, the <coughs> the um, there's there's an argument here that I've heard some interesting sessions on at at national geology meetings that between biologists and paleontologists. The biologists, paleontologists realize that all these phyla of organisms appear very, in geologic terms, very suddenly. Um, and they try to figure out how you're going to evolve them that fast. The biologists tell them, no, that's impossible. That you have to have a, another half a billion years of evolution before the Cambrian to, to account for these different kind of organisms. But there's no fossils, and so you know, the debate goes on. So uh, you can't demonstrate it common ancestor. Hi. Um, I'm fascinated by uh, the uh, question that was addressed uh, to you just a little bit ago, and that was, um, 
half of what um, you as a research biologist tell your students uh, is going to be incorrect. And why, isn't the, uh, why aren't the odds the same in terms of what you tell them about philosophy of religion? You, both you and I are um, research biologists, and we write papers, and we review papers, and we um, argue with our reviewers, and we publish in the peer-reviewed literature. And so um, we are both acutely aware of the fact that science, when writing a paper, constructing a paper, does so in a, in a way that was set up for us several hundred years ago. And that is, we report the data, and then in a completely separate section, hopefully, although sometimes uh, they're combined, but usually, um, we analyze it and discuss it. And those two sections are deliberately held different in science because you want to leave the opportunity for somebody else to come along after you, look at the same data and say, uh, that dumb fellow, he missed the obvious. Uh, we need to go in a completely different direction. Well, if revelation is, in fact, occupying the same place as data in science, then what we should be doing in religion is we should be saying, this is what the data of revelation appear to be saying, and this is how we interpret it, the way we do in science, so that people can come along after us and say, whoever this fellow was, he missed it entirely. We never do that. I guess my question is why? Well, I, I'm not sure we don't ever do that. I, I hear papers being given. Have you ever seen a paper, a religious paper, in which it was organized the way a scientific paper is? Oh, yeah, generally. Uh, a, a lot of study of, of, the, of what's being said and what, what the differences there might be in, in what it actually means. But, there, but there's, a, I would see, a fundamental difference, though, between science and, and theology. Um, if, uh, if Ptolemy, the famous astronomer, said something, well, you know, I, I, I look at what the new data that's accumulated since then, and I decide whether he knew what he's talking about. If Jesus Christ said clearly, I am coming back to, to get you, um, then either that's true or he's a fraud, and why should I care about him? And so there are differences. Uh, uh, there is a God who stands behind the Bible. And yeah, there are things we need to study carefully to be sure we understand it right. But there are also some basic things. Uh, God said, wrote with his finger on stone, uh, seven-day creation. Okay, if that's false, then why should I care about the Bible at all? Um, you know, Do Richard Do Dawkins, I don't, I don't often agree with him, the outspoken atheist. But he, he made an interesting statement that I do agree with. <laughs> and he, I, I can't give it exactly in, uh, word for word, but um, he said, you know, the, the evangelicals, and he, I, when he says evangelical, he's obviously meaning those who take the Bible quite literally. He um, says, that I think that they have it right, in a way. He says, the, in recognizing that there is a deep incompatibility between, between evolution and Christianity. He says, the, those theologians who are, and then he says, uh, how shall we say, they're more sophisticated they think they can have evolutions and the Bible and put it together, and they're happy with that. He says, but they're deluded. It, it, the Bible, either, they're, either God is communicating with us reliably or, or forget it. Um, that doesn't mean we know everything. But there is a foundation of, of claims there that either are true or, or they're nonsense. It's hard, the middle ground really doesn't work too well. That's my assessment. Just uh, to make one comment on that, since I have written uh, uh, some papers, including one that's fairly extensive, um, we didn't have a separate section for data and interpretation, but I made very clear what the data were and then made very clear that this is how I interpret it. So uh, it, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not separated in a... Uh, it would be terribly boring to read a paper that had data and data until your eyes glazed over. And in fact, even in nature, they don't report all the data. If you really want all of the data, you have to get their little supplement thing, and then you can look over those numbers that make your eyes glaze. Um, 
because I had lists of text until your eyes glazed, and it was much easier to read them if you gave the text, if you made the comment, and then you gave the text, and then you made the comment. But you can still make a difference between your, uh, between what the data is and what your interpretation of it is. Your paper, if published in a religious journal, would be unusual because. But I think you're, I think that's the right direction. I wanted to go back to Ptolemy. Ptolemy's facts were correct. Yeah, that's right. And people came along later and said, this is the way the planets move. This is the way the Earth moves. There's a much simpler explanation. And the reason that science could do that is because they were dealing with a reinterpretation of facts that had been known for a long time. Yeah, that's true. In other areas, the facts change more. But you commented earlier that your biblical point of view has enabled you to make hypothesis later proven by science. Could you give us some examples of that? Well, we need several hours, really, but for instance, uh, research down in Peru, um, studying fossil whales, and the, you got a, this formation that's got hundreds, really thousands, thousands, thousands of, of beautifully preserved fossil whales big whales. Um, and the, the understanding of that whole formation is that it occupied about 10 to 12 million years. The sediment accumulated a little bit per thousand years. That's been the, the, the very uh, much accepted interpretation. Um, we came there and the others have studied these for, for 20 years before we got there. And they they didn't, either didn't notice or didn't really take seriously something that hit us in the face right away. And that is to have exquisitely preserved whales that would have taken 10,000 years to get buried is simply an impossibility. It's not going to happen. And there's a lot known about what happens to whales when they, when they die. And so the data indicated you, um, that the fossil data indicated this, this all had to happen very quickly. You had to bury all this very quickly. Okay, we did careful research and put it all together, and, the, uh, and the, our reviewers recognized, yeah, your data support your conclusion. Okay, why didn't others see that? Um, you know, they, they could have. They didn't. Another situation, <coughs> we've been, done research in Wyoming with uh, the Bridger Formation. It has very rich in vertebrae fossils. It's been studied since the railroad went through in 1869. Um, <coughs> and there are several aspects of this I could talk about, but I'll just mention one. It, it spread over a very large area, uh, you know, a thousand square miles, and it's got you get all these rock, these layers, you know, one above the other, and it's got limestones periodically in there, which form in water. The other sediment is was carried by flowing water, sand and mud, etc. And like I say, it's, it's rich in vertebrate fossils, and the museums have just thousands of specimens from there. Now, for a, for a, if you're an evolutionary scientist studying evolution and systematics of these vertebrates, one of the most important things you need to know is the stratigraphy of this formation. In other words, you need to know if this fossil found over here is the same age as this one found 40 miles away. If you don't know that, you're kind of lost. So that is a very important thing you need to know. And yet, that was never done. The stratigraphy mapping the geological formations, the form, the geological units was never done in the Bridger until I did it. Okay, why? Why did a creationist do that when others didn't? And uh, the reason I think is fairly clear, well, some of us are just hard workers and, you know, we don't give up, uh, too stubborn to give up. But also, <coughs> in the literature, it states that these limestones represent local ponds and lakes. So they see this whole formation as forming uh, by, the, by Lyle's uniformitarian concept, it happened the way things happen today. Local ponds and lakes with turtles dying and, and being buried. Well, <coughs> we started seeing things that made us wonder. So we started following these layers, which others hadn't done, because the literature says that you, we couldn't, if it's just local ponds and lakes, you won't be able to figure out the layering over the whole area and make sense of it. But we didn't come with that assumption. And so we started following these layers and it found, no, they're not local. Uh, each of these limestones you can trace all over the several hundred square miles. So that's why we did the mapping and others didn't. You know, they blew it. They, were, they weren't asking the right questions. They didn't have the right worldview. The 
Can I just express uneasiness about what we've heard you say okay. regarding the differences between scientific progress uh, based upon innumerable articles, as Dr. Bull has, has reminded us just now, where the data are presented, and uh, having presented the data, we analyze the data and then come to conclusions. That's scientific publication. And he has edited those papers for many years, and in a smaller way, so have I. Uh, it's not so different in theology. Not that the data have changed. That's what you are saying. When the Bible tells us this about God, yes, there isn't much room for arguing. But there are so many teachings that we can draw out of the Bible about which there are, there are many different interpretations. Prophecy is one thing. And the history of the Adventist church is a good example of that. We read things differently today than they did in the mid-19th century. So the interpretation of what the scripture is telling us can grow and it is subject to the presentation of data and to an analysis of this new interpretation to challenge it and then to come to reasonable conclusions. And I think Dr. Bull is too modest to tell you this, but he has just done that very thing. He has taken a very hard and careful look at the early words of Genesis. And with, a, with an original new translation with Dr. Guy, he's, he's come up with a new way to read that marvelous description of the, the first days of God's creation. I mean, we can question whether that in new interpretation is valid, whether it stands up to critical analysis, and we can come to our own conclusions. But I think the method he uses to do that is admirable. And by all means, let us, let us apply more of the scientific principles to our review of, of theology. Sure. It, it has been done. <coughs> it's, it's done all the time. Different points of view, interpreting gen, uh, Genesis and others. Um, And I would say it kind of comes down to, finally, what is our standard? <coughs> who, who do we really think knows more about the history of life? God or, 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 or us? The God who inspired the Bible writers or, or, or us? And analyzing those words in Genesis is a part of it. But that's, not, that it's only, that's only the very beginning. And we look at... The, all through the Bible, you have references to things in Genesis. So you got to we look at the whole picture, and then what is our standard for deciding which of those interpretations is right? And this is where I think uh, there is a difference in, in how we look at it. There's um, after all of our analysis and after all of our discussion and our study, do we decide that human reasoning and particular science is an adequate guide? Or do we decide that, that um, we, there comes a point where you simply have to bow humbly before God and say, well, you know more than I do? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to comment. Uh, I don't think that our belief in the Bible is a matter of just faith. I don't uh, some like to make that dichotomy. I, uh, I think this is utterly simplistic. Uh, the Bible doesn't have that position. You know, Timothy, uh, Paul tells Timothy, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. We're told in Romans that, uh, you know, God's attributes are clearly seen by what is his internal power in God. There's no excuse for not believing in God. Uh, uh, the Bible is a more rational approach uh, than just blind faith. And, uh, you know, and we just have to, I mean, just look at science and, you know, we ask our, our favorite question we ask around here, you know, where, how did life originate? Uh, you're you're uh, forced by the scientific data to move beyond materialism 
and uh, I have no uh, qualms about it. materialism is again another restricted view. We don't like that. I mean, true, the scientific community adopts it as a whole, uh, but it, it, they've put themselves in a little box uh, and said there's no God, and uh, this, is, this is their designing of it, but it's certainly no way to find truth if there, if there is a God. So, but it seems to me that uh, uh, true, we have confidence in the Bible, but we have good reason for this. Yeah, whether, <coughs> whether it be geographical or scientific. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, uh, a few years ago, at, a, at a, one of the big faith science conferences, the International Faith Science Conference that our church put on, uh, Dr. Fitzguy, a theologian, gave a talk presenting his view of, of, uh, of origins, of you know, Genesis, etc. Um, a co very different view than, than what I think is, is right, what our church accepts. And I, I asked him a question at the end. I said, okay, here are these different points of view. Uh, a more conservative approach, the one you've presented. Do you take your p position because of the scientific evidence? And he immediately said yes. And I see this all through my readings of, of what theologians say about theistic evolution and all the rest. They're taking human understanding of science as their standard. For th and they determine their theology on that. Then they studied the Bible, yeah, but it's clear the standard is what modern science says. And I, I think that's not adequate. <coughs> we need to be more careful than that. Before we go on to the next question, I'll point out that it is 11.30, and I know some people uh, have to leave. Um, but uh, we'll entertain questions as long as uh, Dr. Brand is uh, able to do mm -hmm. so. So uh, go ahead with the next question. I, I hear us talking about science and religion and comparing the two as if uh, a, there's a, a level playing field, there's a neutrality, and the human mind has the capability of discerning and all this. And it seems to me we're forgetting there is a cosmic battle going on. There are forces of good and forces of evil, and they are being operated by two su beings. Mm -hmm. The supreme God, uh, you know, our Savior Christ, he's the, I think he's the ultimate representative for our earth, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the devil. And they're at total opposites. Mm -hmm. And if we can, we think that through our logic, we can come to a, we can study the Bible and come to a proper understanding and reinterpret and all these things and understand science. I think we're deluding ourselves. Uh, if we are, if our minds are not under the control of the Holy Spirit, then we are going to be controlled, whether we realize it or not by the other spirit. There aren't, there's no neutral ground here. So I, I just, I tremble at, at, I hope I'm misunderstanding some of the thoughts that I've heard here today, but uh, even the most brilliant mind, if it's not led by God and his spirit, we're, it's going to go totally off track and we'll end up dis destroying ourselves. I just, well, I agree. And I, these theologians who, who are writing about theistic evolution, they, they clearly accept whatever modern science says. And I don't see evidence that they understand the dominant role of the philosophy of naturalism and how it absolutely controls. Uh, science routinely describes how life came about. You, know, you have this organic soup in the water and, and chance uh, meeting of molecules, etc. Okay, there's absolutely no evidence for that. But why do they, they proclaim it? It's because of the, the absolutely controlling influence of naturalism. And I don't think that's generally recognized. How, how much that determines what conclusions will be drawn in, in study of origins, of history. And so they're, they're they're taking that philosophy and they're without realizing and I think they're, they're making that the standard for how they determine theology. 
Um, the word theology <coughs> in itself says what it is. It's the study of God. It's not the study of man's philosophy or the study. And, and if, if you begin to say it has to be, um, science, I think, affects a lot about what we can believe mm -hmm. about it and helping you to understand about God and so on. But it is about God. And it's not about man's ideas. It's not about sociology. It's not about philosophy. It's about God. And if, if you want to bring everything else in and, and make it something else, you can do that. But to say that, it's, that you should bring everything else into it and then decide what you want to take, th that's not the study of God. Right. Yeah. We find in Revelation, the last message for the a world that is about to perish. And the message is, give glory to God. Mm -hmm. Now, Worship how? The creator. <laughs> right. Who created everything. Yeah. How can Adventists who believe in theistic evolution give glory to God if they, they are actually giving glory to nature. Nature. Every explanation, I mean, if you accept the naturalistic philosophy, then everything is, how do you say, credited to nature instead of God. Well, I mean, that takes throughout the history of the world. The effort of the devil has been always to divert the mind of human beings from the creator to nature. And that's why animals were worshipped in uh, Egypt and so on. So yeah. how, yeah. I, I can't understand if, if I've been tempted, of course, to follow that uh, because some of the arguments seem to be plausible. But I said, then what about our mission? What is our mission as a church? I mean, who, what can I say to somebody who is uh, engrossed in this uh, naturalistic philosophy? What, what can I say about the coming, soon coming, of the creator? And what kind of a creator it is. One, one yeah. thing that's not is often not recognized that if God created by the method of evolution through millions of years, then all the evil and death and pain is part of his plan. It's not the result of, of, of human sin. And this is stated very expressly by a lot of these theologians, that when, if you read what they write. That death and pain, that's a part of God's plan. It had to be that way. <laughs> it's a very different kind of God. That's a suitable description of a pagan God, but it's not of the God of the Bible, in my view. The Bible was written over, what, 1,500 years by 40 authors. Well, how do you interpret when it says, uh, thou shalt have no other God before me, period. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You know, I, and so I believe in a creator because it makes sense to me. Okay. Um, for many years, for hundreds of years, the church taught the world is flat. They even tried to kill some people who says the world is round. Well, you re read in Isaiah 40, church means the Catholic church wrote, okay. You read in Isaiah 40, verse 22. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. Well, does this need any interpretation? No, it does not. The earth is circle. It's, it's round. So what's the problem? I mean, uh, yes, our understanding of the science does change. But the Bible has been written is solid. I mean, we either believe in it or we don't believe in it. I think there's an important point to that one, though, and that is that, that the story that the medieval church believed in a flat earth is, in fact, a 19th century invention. That, uh, I mean, you can go to Augustine, who is probably as authoritative as anybody in that particular regard, and he clearly states that the earth is round. Now, he doesn't know what happens to the people who are in the bottom of the earth because They'd have to stand with their feet up, and he said that wouldn't make sense. So there must not be anybody that lives there. But in terms of, in terms of the roundness of the earth, 
Uh, that's been known since before the time of Christ and generally accepted by that time. Uh, in fact, they even knew that the size of the Earth was about 24,000 miles, which considering that the circumference is actually 24,700 is not a bad guess. And they had reasons for that. Um, it's, I think, a mistake uh, for us to take modern historiography seriously because some of that has been contaminated by the same anti-religious bias that has contaminated science. Uh, I, I would like to say um, thank you for your presentation, but I would uh, like to have you perhaps expound further sometime on some of the uh, things that you have discovered that nobody else uh, discovered before you because of your uh, belief in the veracity of scripture as usually understood. Yeah, I've talked about some of those here. But, uh. <laughs> uh, the, the Bridger Formation, I don't, I don't know that that particular uh, point is, has been brought out before. Yeah. That you figured that you might be able to trace the limestone all the way across yeah, where nobody else about did. Yeah. I talked about those here, didn't I? I'm trying to remember what I talked about. Here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do remember you've discussed a little bit, I think, on the Coconina sandstone. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. We would, well, uh, there's, there's more I could say. Yeah. Uh, we would like to have uh, some more if we can, if we can get you to to discuss it because I think that this is really one of the really important things that makes creationism actually science mm -hmm. is that you are able to form hypotheses, test them, and sometimes they come out right. Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, when this approach has been used, in every case where somebody has taken a, a directly biblical approach and applied it with careful science, we've come out with improved understanding of how to fit you know, how, how it fits the Bible, in every case. Uh, I'm also thinking that uh, the, uh, the uh, Yellowstone Fossil Forest uh, yeah. fits into this same kind of pattern where right. uh, it was claimed at one time that this is uh, formed one way. Creationists looked at it and said, uh, we need to look at other possible hypotheses, and mm -hmm. it turns out that they have more data supporting them. Right. No, not next week. Oh, not next week. Yeah. Sometime. But yeah. Sometime. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm talking about in the future. Okay. Did Dr. Bola and Dr. Brandt go to the same evolutionary church? Pardon me? Is, is Dr. Guy indeed their theologian? Um, well, not Dr. Brandstater's. Although he had, uh, I, I am just starting to read the book that Dr. Bull wrote, uh, along with Dr. Guy. And uh, I can tell you that in the first part of it, uh, they have kept strictly away from interpreting things, uh, that they're starting out with data first, and they're going through uh, what the Hebrew of the Old Testament meant and uh, trying to give as, as literal and as careful a translation and, and one that will help us to get back into the mindset uh, of uh, the people of that age. Uh, and uh, I haven't read it enough to be able to say uh, where they're going with it. You know, I'm a little concerned because uh, Dr. Bull and Dr. Guy both have have in the past uh, uh, denigrated the uh, uh, the standard uh, interpretation, and so I'm looking for that, but I haven't found it yet. So we'll have to see where they go from that, and if you know if they stay on, if they stay with interpreting the text as written, I don't have a big problem with that, and. Um, uh, 
I, I simply agree with you that I think the real problem we have is that there's a 600 pound gorilla that most people are dealing with and they just they start out with uh, uh, evolution is correct the evolutionary time scale or the standard geologic time scale is correct and you just have to accept those and that's where we start from when we interpret Genesis and uh, if you start that way, and Genesis doesn't assume that, and I think it's pretty clear, then you have to say that a good share of Genesis is wrong. Um, and the methodology that you use to, to do that uh, really translates to most of the rest of the Bible is wrong, including Jesus' knowledge of uh, Old Testament history. Yeah. There, there's an interesting division here in how people understand Genesis, Genesis 1. <clears throat> uh, you kind of divide two groups. One are those who, who are truly Hebrew experts, whether they believe the Bible is true or not. They're, they're really experts, and many of them don't believe it's true. And then you have those who are sort of, you know, generally theistic evolutionists. And it's this group who tries to say, well, Genesis doesn't re isn't really saying that's a literal creation week. It isn't saying it's a short, really a short time. They're trying to interpret it some other way. This group over here, who are truly Hebrew experts, they say, you know, the, the, the language, if you understand the Hebrew, it's, it's very obvious those people intended you to understand that they're describing a literal week creation and a short time of Earth history. Now, they, they probably will say, well, now, we know that's not true because of modern science. But that's clearly what the writers of Genesis were trying to say. So it's, it's the people who are trying to find a, a, a fit between evolution and the Bible. They're the ones that try to reinterpret Genesis and say, well, you know, it really doesn't say a six, literal six-day creation week. That's an interesting division. Thank you very much.